diffraction, the mother of all photography lens problems. Diffraction is a word that we've all heard, but don't really understand. It's a word that sounds rather cool, but leaves many of us unable to explain its meaning. But when we get into it, we'll discover that diffraction is ruining our images. Let's start simple. Now, we all know that as we decrease the size of our aperture, we let less light reach the sensor. But it also increases our depth of field. That's the range of sharpness either side of the focus point. Now, we can easily compensate for the decrease in light by, well, adding more light, either more light or more time. So therefore, it would seem sensible that if we wanted a super sharp landscape or portrait image with maximum sharpness range, that we should just choose the smallest aperture of, say, f16 or f22. Yes, no. Sadly, as we decrease the size of the hole, things become more painful. Photographically speaking, of course. Every lens has what's known as a sweet spot. That's a focal distance and aperture setting where optically that lens is as good as it gets. Take this 90 mm portrait lens. At four meters at a mid-sized aperture of f8, the MTF graph looks flatter than a dead person hooked up to an ECG. And that's a good thing, unlike the dead person, because a flat line on an MTF graph indicates excellent optical performance. But as we decrease the aperture from, say, f8 to f11 to f16 to f22, we should, theoretically, be increasing our sharpness. But due to diffraction, things just start to fall apart. And what we end up with is a loss of contrast, a softening of the image, and a reduction in image quality. But why? Unfortunately, because of damned physics. I can't change the laws of physics. Diffraction effects are less when we use a large aperture. But at large apertures, spherical aberration will cause fuzziness at the periphery of the image. A smaller aperture reduces aberration, but increases diffraction. All lenses, even ones that are optically perfect and with perfect aperture design, will be diffraction limited, meaning that it has reached its limit of maximum optical performance. So the only factor that will bring the lens down from its mighty pedestal is diffraction. Now, obviously no lens is perfect, and other factors such as poor optical and aperture design can exacerbate the problem. It can also cause other problems such as low contrast, aberration, bad color fidelity, and poor resolution. Additionally, and more importantly, this whole shenanigans of diffraction is made worse by interference at the photo sites on the sensor. So what's actually happening? Well, light or photons are an interesting phenomena. They propagate as both waves and as particles. But waves-particles duality is even too complicated for most scientists. So let's look at waves. Create plane waves and partially block them with an aperture. As those waves pass through that hole, they will bend and start to interfere with each other. If we translate that to light, then the interference pattern looks more like this. Here, you would expect to see a dot of light on the wall from the laser with a shadow line from the obstruction of the wire. But instead, the light waves are deflecting around the obstruction, causing an interference pattern and actually cancelling light out. If we make a tiny hole in some foil to simulate an aperture, you would expect to see a tiny dot of light on the other side. But instead, the resulting interference of those light waves cancel each other out and create what is known as an airy disk. 
Now, even though this hole is much bigger than the wavelengths of light passing through it, it's the edges of the aperture that cause much of the problem through something called knife edge diffraction, where a sharp edge causes electromagnetic waves or light to change direction. And as we bring those edges closer together, the airy disc problem becomes exaggerated. The size of the airy disc is where the problems occur, especially in conjunction with the size of the photocytes on the sensor that the airy discs are landing on. So although a lens with super-engineered optics and aperture blades would help reduce the problem, it can never disappear completely. Because remember that because of physics and the properties of light, there is always a diffraction-limiting factor, even in a perfect optical system. Equally, if we change the physical size of the sensor, then the photosite sizes can change too. So 100 megapixels in this space means bigger photosites and less diffraction. Or 100 megapixels in this space will mean smaller photosites and more diffraction. So the challenge for camera manufacturers is both lens design and sensor design. For ultra-critical work where I need super clarity but also maximum depth of field, then I photograph with an altogether different technique called focus stacking. This is where I will shoot at my lens's sweet spot or close to it of say f11 to get less diffraction but sadly also less depth of field. But instead of one photo, I will shoot a series of images via my tethered software. For each photo, the lens focuses at a slightly deeper point across the subject. The resulting images are then composited together in focus stacking software, providing me a much higher clarity result. Now that's fine for a subject that doesn't move, but what if we're doing a beauty shoot or portrait of a person? Well then we have to find the best shooting distance where we can get the depth of field we need at an aperture that is acceptable in terms of diffraction. For me, the limit on this camera and lens is around f16. Beyond that, then any gains in depth of field are cancelled out by a loss of contrast or softening of fine detail. And of course, that's something that I don't want. Camera manufacturers try to deal with diffraction in a number of ways, including the best optical quality, improved aperture design, and also in the post-processing that is applied before the image is delivered. We can also use techniques in software such as Photoshop to adjust the contrast levels in localized areas where the effects of diffraction were most noticeable. And these techniques, as well as the best practices for lighting and focus stacking, are demonstrated in depth on the world's leading visual arts platform at visualeducation.com. So we all now know that diffraction isn't something that we can eliminate. Like wasps at your picnic, it's just something that we have to manage. And in photography, it's our choice of aperture, lenses, photo site size, sensor design, and post-production choices that can help us from getting stung.